Omagina Timirandasya Gyananjala Shalakaya Chakshu Unmilitam Jina Tasmay Shri Guru Venamaha Guru Ve Gaura Chandraya Radhikaya Tadalaya Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Taravaktaya Namo Namaha <coughs> Yam Prabhajanta Manapetyam Apeti Krityam Dvai Paino Viraha Katara Ajuhava Putre Titam Mayatayo Tarvo Vinedustam Sarvabutam Munimanatoshmi Bhaktiya Vina Aparada Lakshay Shiptas Chakarmati Taranga Madhye Kripa Maitvam Sharanam Prapana Prinde Namaste Charana Ravindam Vajami Radam Aravinda Netram Smarami Radam Madurashmitasyam Vada miradam karuna varadram tato mamanasti katiena chapi. I first of all offer millions of millions of dandavat pranams unto the lotus feet of my most beloved Gurudev Nityalila Prabhishta Om Asto Tarasara Shishimad Shila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. And the same again millions of millions of times unto the lotus feet of our most beloved Nityalila Prabhishta Om Asto Tarasara Shishimad Shila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada and all our Rupa Nuga Guru Vadya dandavat pranams. Dandavat pranams to all the Vaishnava and Vaishnavi devotees of the Lord sitting in Gopinath Bhavan on a cold day. Gold Premanandi Hari Hari Bol. <coughs> so, yesterday we introduced the third canto and we introduced the characters, the personalities of Vidura and of Uddhava principally. And uh, we were understanding the importance of these two personalities because they had had so much time with Krishna. Maitreya, who's about to speak what we hear next, didn't have so much association as Vidura and Uddhava. His association was more limited, but still he was a great, great personality because he heard from his guru, Parashara Rishi, who's the father of Veda Vyas. So we describe so many things about Mahabharata and the different pastimes. Now today, um, there's eight chapters. I think it is. Eight chapters describing Sarga and Visharga. So at the end of the second canto, Shukadeva Goswami, he says this beautiful verse, Atra Sargo Visargas Cha, um, Stanam Poshanam Utaya, Manvanta Anuna Ishwara, uh, Niroda Muktiya Ashraya. These are the ten subject matters of this Srimad Bhagavatam. So, this Srimad Bhagavatam, as we've said so often, is non-different to Krishna. And Sanatan Goswami is giving a very beautiful verse in his Krishna Leela Stava. Mandeka bando mat sangim, mat guru man mahadane, man nistaraka mat bhagya, madananda namostute. And this means, O holy Bhagavat, you are my only company. You are my only friend. <clears throat> and my guru, you are my greatest treasure, my personal savior, the album, the emblem of my utmost fortune and the very form of ecstasy. I offer obeisances unto you. Jai Sachinandana Gaurahari. So, this is the mood of Sanatan Goswami in accepting this Bhagavat as his friend, his only company, his greatest friend, his greatest company. So, it's a very beautiful prayer in glorification of this Bhagavatam. Actually, in the twelfth canto, there is so much glorification of the Bhagavatam. We have to appreciate its exalted nature in our lives 
Of course, the Acharyas have given us so many corollaries. They have taken aspects and fluffed it out, like the glory of bhakti, Madhurya Kadambini, etc., by Srila uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. So they've taken from this, but this Bhagavatam itself is the essence. So now Vidura, he's met Maitreya Rishi in Haridwar on the bank of the Ganga. We've gone from the Jamuna to the Ganga. And Vidura, even though he's such an exalted person, he presents very preliminary questions to Maitreya out of his deep humility. Always this mood of humility is what is going to endear us to any elevated soul. If you come in front of an elevated soul and you say, oh, I have nothing, I am nothing, please tell me what is the purpose of life. Just like Sanatana Goswami himself, when he came in front of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sanatana Goswami was honored by all the pundits in uh, Ram Keli, where he was. All the uh, Muslim people, they would all honor him, even they would honor him. All the Vaishnavas would honor him as a great scholar and a pundit. Yet when he came in front of Mahaprabhu, he initially, they both had straw in their mouths when they approached him at Ram Keli. But then later on, when he came to Varanasi and met Mahaprabhu in the house of, was it Tapana Mishra? Then uh, <clears throat> he, he, he said, I, I know nothing. Please, people call me a scholar but that's just their foolishness. Actually, um, and please tell me, what is the purpose of this existence? What is the purpose of life? So it's like, each time you ask that question, it's like a retake. It's like, yes, up till now, I understood it to one degree, but now I'm gonna blank that out and try and go deeper and understand it again. And then later on, we'll blank that out and go deeper again. That's the process. To it's like a musician, I've said many times. If a musician thinks that he's playing something pretty crash hot, he can't really go any further. But if he thinks, well, that wasn't that good, I can do better than that. I can always that mood of that greed to increase, and certainly the enthusiasm to increase understanding of Sri Krishna is certainly enhanced by this Bhagavatam. There's no end to it. I was thinking the other day, like, really trying to contemplate what's it like to think of an endless ocean. It doesn't have a bottom. Can you imagine? It doesn't have an end to it. It goes, in the conditioned state, we can't conceive of that endlessness, that fathomless ocean. But actually, this is the nature of this. In one life, you can never actually, you know, understand everything. We're going to try and do, well, I'm not even going to try and do eight chapters today. I'm going to I think I'm going to get through four or five, and then we'll have to tail it through tomorrow. But um, each verse, each word is so potent and so saturated with different aspects, different perspectives of the truth. Like yesterday, we were fo focusing on the personalities, how much truth and sweetness and development of our attraction to Krishna can be increased by just contemplating the glories of Vidura or Uddhava, for example. The essence of life we knew the first day we came to Krishna consciousness was to become attracted to Krishna, more attracted to Krishna than this material world. So it's an ongoing progression. It's an ongoing river. It's a current that we're in trying to understand deeper and deeper. So Vidura is questioning Maitreya in a very submissive way um, manner of he's actually saying how to get in the second verse of this fifth chapter we're discussing now how to get happiness he's asking the most simple basic how to get everyone asks this question this is what Bhagavatam presents even though we're going to describe something so elevated and so lofty still the question is how can I be happy and of course, the only happiness that the soul can experience is when he's performing enthusiastic seva for Krishna directly. And guru, of course, is non-different to Krishna for the conditioned soul. So this is the only happiness ever that the jiva can experience. 
all the distractions in the material world are just distractions. <clears throat> so he asked this very humble question. And then, of course, Maitreya, his heart melts. And then he begins to describe directly to Vidura, Vidura's own identity that Vidura already knows, of course, but he starts talking about Mandavya Rishi, how he, was, uh, how he cursed Yamaraj, and how Yamaraj became embodied as Vidura in this world. So he describes all that directly to Vidura, out of great affection, because his heart is melting, melting because he's Tri Kalagya, he's a realized soul, Maitreya Rishi, so he can read the forehead, he can see everything. He's never met Vidura before. I've not heard of any instance where Maitreya has met Vidura before this instance. So he describes all that. And in other words, they make a beautiful, you know, bond, a relationship immediately where that has to be there for transcendental knowledge to be imparted. It's saying even in Bhagavad Gita, you can't challenge for this knowledge. It's not, it's not of that nature. When we are speaking on the street, etc., to different people, we can't just bucket it out to anybody not esoteric truths. We can give some glimmer, some indication, but the real heart of it can only transpire when there's sweet relationship there, when there's trust. Because it goes over the cliff of consciousness, more or less. It goes into the achintya bar, the inconceivable, which is what we're going to discuss today. Krishna Mahavishnu, he's lying in the causal ocean, and from the pores of every pore of his skin is emanating unlimited billions of universes. That's off the cliff materially. You can't, you can't think about, you know, conceive of it. It's achintyabhav. So that trust in the authority of where is this coming from has to be gradually in place. And this is happening in the process. So this is also chronological. Janavi yesterday asked this question about chronology. I've been thinking about it all the time because it's, it's not easy and it's a wonderful question to try and find that sequence because it doesn't really exist in the conditioned way. It exists in another way. If we serve the Bhagavad, then that chronological flow will actually start to become appreciated by us. It's not just going to drop. We actually have to serve this Bhagavatam. It's by serving Guru we're going to get his mercy. By serving Bhagavatam, we're also going to get the Bhagavatam's mercy. It's not just ink and paper. It's a personality. It's more than just a personality. It's actually Krishna himself. So by rendering service, and how do we render service? By speaking it, by chanting it, by reading it, by studying it, by holding it, by being with it. It's described, even if you have the Bhagavatam in your house, it's considered like a deity. And Narada Muni will always visit that home where there's a set of Bhagavatams. So like this, we have to connect with this personality of Bhagavatam and serve, render service, and then the Bhagavatam will give us its mercy in the form of comprehension of chronology, what you're saying. <laughs> I think that is the answer to your question, because it's not. Because today we're going to discuss the creation. Maitreya is going to discuss, he's going to describe an aspect of it for Vidura. And then two chapters on, after Vidura asks some questions, then he's going to get into it more specifically. And it would seem trying to balance the two up is chronologically impossible materially. So let's begin and just walk through it and see. <coughs> okay. So Maitreya begins to describe the creation manifesting from Krishna. This is called Sarga. Sarga is when... Krishna creates from Mahavishnu to Garvadakshai Vishnu, Shiradakshai Vishnu. Visharga is when Lord Brahma creates the sub creation of the progenitors, etc., and all the different personnel populates the planets, creates the planets. That's called Visharga. So, first of all, it's Sarga. So, he's describing the impregnation by Kala and the Jiva, impregnating this Pradhan this unconglomerate, um, like soup it's described in the Bhagavatam by Prabhupada, an unconglomerate soup. And this impreg, just like the embryo within a womb of a mother, it's, it has no cohesiveness until 
the male semen injects there, and then it becomes like a fetus, then it becomes like an entity. So this is the state of the cosmic um, creation, exactly the same principle. So Krishna is injecting that uh, seed of jiva and kala, time. And this is what Maitreya is explaining to Vidu. This actually is the essence of the Bhagavatam. There's no other literature in the world that I've ever heard of that describes this cosmic manifestation. There isn't. And this should give us great faith that it's a reality because it can be described in such minute detail that it practically blows your mind. And it's actually saying at the end of the seventh chapter that even Brahma, Shiva, and Rudra, they can no longer understand all this sequence themselves. They give up. They just offer prayers to Krishna. They give up trying to understand it. It's so, you know, involved. But this gives us confidence of its reality. If something can't be explained, like an impersonal path or something, or they talk about sometimes one hand clapping and all kind of strange things like this, and, you know, you're just supposed to understand something, but it doesn't really give you much trust or confidence in it. But something that can so explicitly be explained, surely it gives us great respect and regard. This is needed because the heart has to be in that sort of condition to actually have this truth land on it, to realize it, to appreciate what it is, this truth. So then, Kala and uh, the Jivas are impregnated into the material energy. And the three modes of material nature simultaneously are impregnated. This creates the Mahatattva in Sattva Gun, which destroys ignorance. That is the principle of Sattva Gun, to destroy ignorance. So the ignorance of the dormant, sleeping, material world. It's in a dormant, sleeping condition. So this um, Mahatattva, this Sattva Gun, is waking that up. It transforms into a hunkar. I told you it's a little bit heady now. It's a little, I'm not a scientist, and it's quite scientific, the presentation. I'm going to read it anyway, and how you can get from it, and then we'll say something afterwards. <clears throat> and then from the ahankar, which shelters the three types of suffering, adhyatmic, adibotic, and adidaivic, from that ahankar, is manifesting, transforms into the gross elements. So, and then the senses and the mind, and then divided into Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva. And then the mind is coming from a transformation of Sattva itself. Then the false ego is interacting with different modes, the sources of all material and phenomenal worlds. The senses are products of passion, philosophical speculation, and fruitive acts represent the mode of passion. So these modes are being clearly described by Maitreya in this aspect, this particular aspect of the creation. We can't put it in a chronological place because this is more advanced than the actual Krishna just creating, it, it's something else here. He's overlapping. Just like tomorrow or the next day when we discuss Varaha, he overlaps the two types of Varaha, the Sweta Varaha and the Shyam Varaha. He overlaps them both initially and then it becomes specific. So now he's overlapping somewhat because he starts to describe the Devas. And the Devas are an aspect that are manifested by Lord Brahma in the Visharga. But it's described that the devas want to perform their seva in um, relationship to all the bodily limbs of the jivas, because each limb is controlled by a particular deva. When you raise your hand, you're connecting with a deva. When you move your legs, etc., it's all connecting with all the devas, the sub controllers of the material world. So. It's described later on, I'm sure circuiting a bit, but 
the the demigods they're, they're, they're not feeling any cohesiveness or any unity. This is described actually twice in the Bhagavatam. This is not the first time that this is being described. It's the second time through. So it's making the point that without Krishna's mercy, not even the demigods can actually work. So now we're coming back to the heart of bhakti. Without Krishna's mercy, nothing can transpire. So the devas, because they're disunited, they're not united in their understanding of how to perform their seva. So it's described, and there's 12 verses in this fifth chapter where the demigods, the devas, they're offering beautiful, heart-rendering prayers to Krishna to please unite us in our understanding of actually how our seva is to manifest. So Krishna has to come. Each time Krishna, so this constant reference to that Krishna is the platform, he's the, he's the um, what do you call, uh, foundation of everything. This is enhancing our bhakti because the conditioned soul is so illusioned to thinking that he's the controller because we have this spark of independence. We're so deeply controlled by that, thinking that I am the controller. I will arrange my life in this particular way, etc. I will do this, I will do that. This has to be purified to appreciate that Krishna, from the very beginning, is the supreme controller. So this is what these descriptions, they, what do you call, uh, push into the heart, this understanding. This is the mercy of the sages to try and realize that we are very, 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 very tiny. We're so insignificant. And here we're hearing about that Supreme Lord who is the most wonderful and sweet at the same time. So only the devotees who are chanting Hare Krishna can reconcile all these apparent contradictions of Krishna's greatness and Krishna's sweetness simultaneously. Actually, the very last verse of this Srimad Bhagavatam is glorifying the holy name. The verse is Nama Sankirtanam Yasya Sarva Papo Pranashanam Pranamo Dukha Samshayas Tam Namami Hari Harim Param. This is saying, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord Hari, the congregational chanting of whose holy names destroys all sinful reactions and the offering of obeisances unto whom relieves all material suffering. This is the last verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the conclusion of the Bhagavatam. So this conception is there throughout. This bhakti sa. Bhakti sa is the essence. So by hearing these descriptions, even when you read them, they're very difficult to focus if you're not so scientifically inclined. It's talking about the manifestation of the different senses, who are the different demigods in charge of the different senses, the divisions, etc. It's, it's very technical. But if we understand what is the purpose of this description, it's to give us great faith in this, the words of this Bhagavatam, that it's capable of describing the smallest detail of creation. This world is phenomenal. There are so many things, and yet it can all be described scientifically. That is amazing in itself. So we get great faith from that. So these beautiful prayers by the demigods are the final part of that fifth chapter. Now we're coming to the sixth chapter of this third canto. And this is called the fourth description of the Virata Rupa. So we've already had three descriptions. Remember, the first one was by Sutta Goswami, right at the beginning. And then again, by Shukadev Goswami, twice to Parikshit Maharaj. I think that's right. And giving us the clear understanding of, our, again, our absolute insignificance. Gurudev would say, how many times, you know, in a day, Trinada Pi Suni Chena, it's not just so that, you know, we can perfect our own liberated conditions, so to speak, but it's so that we can understand 
this phenomenal presentation of the Bhagavatam, if we're feeling this deep insignificance in comparison to the Supreme Lord, then it has a place for us to understand it, to comprehend it to some degree. You understand? So it's all linked. There's nothing like separate from it. Even though it's technical, it's still the bhakti sa, the current, the essence is flowing. So now, in this sixth chapter, it's described how the Lord enters all the elements and makes them all cohesive in answer to the demigods' prayers for this unity. So we sometimes think, oh, our sac Sangha is fractured and it's not unified. Not even the demigods could get unification, you know, right at the very beginning. So it's not something unusual, you know, that we're in this particular condition. And now he describes how the elements such as the Mahatattva are developed um, from the Lord's Shakti. And this, in effect, is Maya Shakti in the 23 elements of Ahankara, the five working senses, the five gross elements and the 11 other senses. The Lord enters the universe after creating it. And he awakens the dormant karmas in the jivas. I went quite quickly through that part. You have to read that part yourselves to understand it. It's not, I can just speak the words, but it's, to get the realization of that is not so easy. And now it's described that the Lord becomes like a fetus and in which all the planets and all the living entities exist. And then, in the sixth verse, it, the um, Virata Rupa form. This is described right at the beginning as being imaginary. It's imaginary, yet still we appreciate it because it's showing us the enormity or it's showing us Krishna's energy within everything, that nothing in existence is separate from Krishna. This is Advaya Gyan Paratattva. This is essential for us to actually appreciate this um, supremacy of the Supreme Lord. And then we acknowledge our insignificant, the hardest thing for the Jiva to give up is his minute independence. It's a jewel that's coming from Krishna. The idea of our minute independence is so that we can choose Krishna rather than the material energy to serve. That's why we have it. In other words, we can choose to love Krishna or to turn away from Krishna. That's why we have that independence. But this jewel of independence, when it's materially um, covered, is very hard to purify. This is actually what Guru wants. This is all he wants from us. Please give me your independence and then I can give all success in all of your life and all of your efforts. If you give, but the jiva doesn't want to do it. It's very hard for the jiva to do that. It doesn't matter even how much knowledge you have. Still to give up that, you know, independent nature is not easy. So this is the quality of the great saints that they have been able to give up their independence to their guru and the guru vargya. And only then, in that condition, can the current flow into the heart of the jiva to comprehend these topics clearly. So in this fifth chapter, this is describing, um, again, details of the virata rupa form. And it's saying in the 40th verse, the last verse, that Brahma, Rudra, and Brihaspati gave up trying to understand it and just offered prayers to it. So that's the, um, uh, it shows the uh, complexity of that topic. So Maitreya Rishi, he's describing both of these things initially. This creation by Krishna, not in the same way that we've heard it in the Brahma Samhita. It's not just direct like that. That's not how he's describing it in this chapter. He's describing about the manifestation of the senses and the different modes of material nature and how they evolve, etc. It seems to be in a more complex manner, is how he initially sets the scene. And then in the seventh chapter, then Vidura asks some beautiful questions that how can Krishna 
be affected by the gunas that are material. If he's going to create all this, then he must have some contamination by those gunas. And this is where the Bhagavatam truths are so essential, because Maitreya is explaining that it is Shakti that is developing this. It's not Krishna who is developing this. It's called Shakti Paranam, Parinamvad. We read this in the Jaivadama also. It's not Vastu Parinamvad. Vastu Parinamvad means that Krishna himself is transforming into all these details of the modes of material nature, etc. And this is what our Parampara had understood previous to the advent of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It was Chaita in uh, Madhavacharya. He was understanding that it is all Vastu Parinamvad, that Krishna is transforming to create this material phenomena. But then Mahaprabhu is explaining, no, it is Shakti. It is Krishna's energies from Swarup Shakti to Baladev through that Sandini Shakti. That is what is actually creating. It's not Krishna directly. So to separate the differences between Krishna's energy and Krishna himself is very wonderful for the devotees to appreciate. This is all part of knowledge that is clearing our embedded ignorance. When this ignorance becomes somewhat pushed away, then we're able to see what is the glory of Krishna. Everywhere, in every person that we meet, in all atmosphere, in every detail, particularly, of course, in the holy dams, when we can see and appreciate Krishna's presence so much more powerfully here, because he lived here, he walked here, he breathed here, he performed his pastimes here. So there's so much that we can see when this knowledge is purified from the ignorance. So Vidura is asking this, and then it's saying in this 12, uh, 11th verse, it's saying how the Atma, um, no, I'll leave that. Then in the 12th, it's, it's saying that ignorance is gradually purified by this Bhakti Mishra Gyan. So Bhakti Devi has not fully blossomed, but still um, knowledge of what is Bhakti is beginning to manifest in the Jiva's heart. This is internally where the Jiva can appreciate he's up to. Do you all understand what I'm saying? It's all clear? Something. I'm trying to explain these three or four chapters that are very, very technical when you read them. And it's not always easy to plow through them if you don't have a technical mind to understand them. But if you look for the deeper levels within them to understand where is Bhakti, these chapters haven't been given for any other purpose other than to serve Bhakti Devi or to generate Bhakti Devi in the heart of the Jiva. This is the purpose of Maitreya speaking to Vidura. This is the essence of life. This devotion, devotion to Krishna, is the essence of our lives. It's the dharma of the soul. It's the jiva dharma of the soul. And now, um, coming to the eighth chapter is very wonderful. The eighth chapter, Maitreya Rishi describes, it becomes a little chronological here. It becomes a little more simple to appreciate how the Kumaras, they travel to the bottom of the universe and they meet Lord Sankrashan. And Sankrashan, with his thousands of hoods, um, begins to recite this Srimad Bhagavatam. So what is the Srimad Bhagavatam that he's reciting? He's reciting this knowledge of creation and sub-creation. This Sarga and Visharga. This is what he's describing to the Kumaras. Then the Kumaras, they hear that from Lord Sankrashan, and then they go and speak that same Bhagavatam to Sankhya, <coughs> Sankaranya, Sankaranya Muni. And then Sankaranya Muni, he speaks that same Bhagavatam to Brihaspati, Parshara, and Parshara, the father of Vedavyas, it's described and the guru of Maitreya, his father was killed by a Rakshasa. So, Parashara Rishi, he made a Yagya 
just like Jung Mi Jai made a yagna to kill all the snakes after his father Parikshit had been bitten and wanted to kill all the snakes in the universe, so Parashara Rishi wanted to kill all the Rakshasas in existence. So he began to kill through this yagya all the Rakshasas. Then Vashishtya, who is a son of Lord Brahma and very much respected amongst the sages, he came to that yagya and he told uh, Parashara not to do this. He said this was not a good thing. These personalities were there for a purpose. He was not to destroy the whole race of Rakshasas. And Parashara respected and honor, honored Vaishishtya Rishi at that time. And because of his respect to Vaishishtya Rishi, then Pulastya Rishi, who's another son of Lord Brahma, he is the one who generates all the Rakshasas and all the demons. They're all coming from Pulastya Rishi. Pulastya Rishi was that personality who carried Govardhan from the Himalayas, remember? He went and asked Dronachal, the father of Govardhan, can I take you? And then he walked through the airways carrying Govardhan. That was Pulastya Rishi, whose purpose and job is to generate all the demons and Rakshasas. They have a purpose. They have a purpose in existence. They generate like the opposition, so to speak. When you see, you know, the opposition, then you go more the other side. It helps the jiva to develop, just like opposition in governments and so on. You know, it keeps the central government on track. So, Pulastya Rishi became very satisfied that Parashara had stopped that yagya. And he benedicted him with the benediction that he would be able to speak fluently the details of the Bhagavatam, the Purana. He gave him this benediction. So then Parashara, on the strength of that benediction, was able to satisfy Maitreya Rishi, his disciple. So now, this is a very important section for the purpose of establishing the, the authority of this Bhagavatam. Maitreya Rishi has just described these incredible phenomena. Now, where do they come from? Who is this person? Where? One person once asked me, it's actually my brother-in-law, he said, how do you know all the scriptures aren't just made up? How do you know they're not just, you know, someone just written it all off and just, you know, big hoax? How do you know that, you know? This is an important question, really. What is our authority? What is our line? So here, Maitreya Rishi is taking the trouble to explain the line, explain where this Bhagavatam has been recited previously, where he heard it previously. He heard it from Parashara Rishi, who heard it from Brihaspati, who heard it from... Uh, Sankhya Muni, who heard it from the Kumaras, who heard it from Lord Sankarshan. It's authorized, it's stamped all the way through. It can't be refuted. It has authority. We have to have great faith in this because the conceptions that are being... Pre just like when the... Um, when, uh, what was it, in the late 60s or 70s, they said they'd been to the moon. And Prabhupada said, no, they haven't been to the moon. How can they go to a heavenly planet? And most of the devotees believed, but some didn't, because they didn't have that platform of absolute faith, you know, in Guru's words. So do we have absolute faith in the Bhagavatam? This is what it's asking us. Can we accept the Achintya Bhav, what is inconceivable to us? Can we accept that? Because when we get into the realm of Rasa, Tattva, that is even more a challenge if we haven't accepted that achintya bhav in this atma tattva. If we haven't accepted that here, how are we going to accept it that we'll just become like sahajiyas? Actually, if we can't appreciate this platform that is being offered to us through the Bhagavatam. And now in this eighth chapter, again, a further description is being given of the creation. How the jivas... I find this part really fascinating. The jivas are within the body of Garbhadokshai Vishnu. And it's describing that the force of their desire to enjoy fruitive acts pierces the navel of Garbhadokshai Vishnu. Because they want to enjoy so much, it pierces his navel and that lotus comes 
where Lord Brahma manifests. But it's because of their desire to enjoy fruitive acts. And look at the world, look at ourselves. How much passion is there to perform acts that will have a, a fruitive result? I go to work, I make some money, and I get this. I do a bit of cooking, and I get this. I can take this offering, this prashant. You know, everything, even our relationships. I'll be nice to you and stroke your back, and then you'll be nice to me and stroke my back. Then I'll be happy and smiling in the world. You know, it's such an illusion that we actually live in. And it's all motivated by our various material, fruitive desires. All the way through. Even as devotees, I'm talking about us. <laughs> Talk about me. So this, these fruitive desires is what pierced. The word is pierced. This is the word that's, that Prabhupada uses. Pierced his navel. And from that navel comes this effulgent lotus that illuminates the whole area. And Lord Brahma, he becomes seated on that lotus. This is in very brief the eighth chapter. And then I'm going straight through into the ninth chapter where Lord Brahma manifests on that lotus and he's bewildered. We know we're more familiar with this from Brahma Samhita. He goes down the stem of the lotus looking for its origin. And he can't find it. He can't see anything. It's all dark in all different directions. And uh, he's confused about what to do. And then um, he hears from Mother Saraswati this Gopal mantra from Divya Saraswati. This is eternal Saraswati from the spiritual realm. He hears this Gopal mantra. And then he meditates on that Gopal mantra for a hundred years. And after his meditation and austerity, then Krishna plays his flute song, which comes in the form of the Kam Bij mantra. So that's the second mantra. When he hears that Kam Bij mantra, he becomes very purified to such a degree where he can actually see Krishna. Then at that stage, I'm talking from the Brahma Samhita now to fill in the spaces between the descriptions here in the Bhagavatam. Then he actually sees Krishna, he sees Garva Dakshai Vishnu. And in the Bhagavatam now, there's, um, I think, something like 12 or 13 beautiful verses describing the effulgence of this personality, Garva Dakshai Vishnu. The beautiful lotus eyes, the jewel like toenails, his effulgent smile, his uh, beautiful waist belt, his armlets, etc. And the sound of Vedic hymns are prominent. I mean, can just. Just for imagine for a moment, how spectacular if you're an artist, you know, painting something like that. Very wonderful. And, and Lord Brahma is seeing that directly. And then he has a direct exchange with Krishna. And Krishna is empowering him to um, create the material worlds. Krishna speaks to him. And um, there's... 15 verses where, sorry, 11 verses which are spoken directly by Krishna to Lord Brahma. And then it's described that Lord Brahma, he becomes surcharged with the mode of passion to create. And he needs, he still needs direction from Krishna exactly how to do it. So again, we're seeing the prominence or, or the, the reality of Krishna being the background of everything. Nothing is moving without Krishna. So then in, the, um, in this um, ninth chapter, Lord Brahma, he begins to chant the most beautiful prayers to Krishna. I've actually broken the chronological order from the Bhagavatam here because I just described Krishna speaking but before Krishna speaks Lord Brahma um, chants these very beautiful prayers and I just want to read a couple of them he's praying for the creative direction the creative energy how can I create he's asking Krishna how can I create 
So Lord Brahma said, this is after he's seen him in the Garbhadak Ocean, Oh my Lord, today, after many, many years of penance, it's a hundred years of penance, I have come to know about you. He didn't even really know the identity of Krishna till he saw Garbhadakshaya Vishnu. He was bewildered. Oh, how unfortunate the embodied living entities are that they are unable to know your personality. So how do we get chronology out of this? He's talking about the unfortunate jivas. He hasn't even manifested them yet. You understand? This is where we have to sort of go ahead and go back at the same time. Oh my Lord, you are, only know you are the only knowable object because there is nothing supreme beyond you. If there is anything supposedly superior to you, it is not the absolute. You exist as the supreme by exhibiting the creative energy of matter. And then he goes on for 12 verses, very beautiful prayers, glorifying Krishna directly. Lord Brahma, the master of this universe, the architect of this universe, and he's glorifying Krishna in this ninth chapter, very beautifully. And then at the end of these creative prayers, this is when um, Krishna appears. And the sage Maitreya said, O Vidura, after absorbing, observing the source of his appearance, Lord Brahma, I hope I haven't confused you because I, I went ahead and now I've come back again. So just rewind. Thank you. <laughs> rewind, yeah. I was getting carried into the next two chapters. It's, not, it's a challenge, you know, trying to put eight chapters all in one block and think of the chronological order so that we can appreciate it and understand it. And when I was thinking about Janavi's question yesterday, I thought, well, this is our service to the Bhagavatam, to unravel it and to be able to present it in a chronological way that we can understand it and include the Achintya aspect also simultaneously. So, O Vidura, after absorbing, observing the source of his appearance, namely the personality of Godhead, this is Garbhadakshai Vishnu, Brahma prayed for his mercy as far as his mind and words would permit him. Thus, having prayed, he became silent, as if tired from his activities of penance, knowledge, and mental concentration. I think it's very personal when the Bhagavatam puts some. You're talking about this great, almost like unreal type of person, but he becomes tired. He's just performed all these beautiful prayers, all this long-term penance, and his mental concentration, and now he's tired. And Krishna, he responds and reciprocates with that. The Lord saw that Lord Brahma was very anxious about the planning and construction of the different planetary systems and was depressed upon seeing the devastating water. He could understand the intention of Brahma and thus he spoke in deep thoughtful words, removing all the illusion that had arisen. This is the Bhagavatam. This is the core of the Bhagavatam. It's Krishna himself. Whenever Krishna begins to speak, just like in the Chatur Shloki, it's Krishna directly speaking. Now here, it's Krishna's words directly. This is, the Bhagavatam is like a jewel, and the heart of it is Krishna's words directly. <clears throat> the Supreme Personality of Godhead then said, O Brahma, O depth of Vedic wisdom, be neither depressed nor anxious about the execution of creation. What you are begging from me has already been granted before. So many, many times, putting it in its um, context, that so many times this world has been created again and again. Even the pralaya at the end of Lord Brahma's day, Lord Brahma still has to create again at the end of the pralaya. Each day, every day he wakes up in the morning, the first thing he's got to do is create all the planetary systems. The higher ones are still there, from Mahaloka, Tapaloka, Satyaloka, they're still there, but all the lower ones he has to do all over again. That's his first activity every morning he wakes up. O Brahma, situate yourself in penance and meditation and follow the principles of knowledge to receive my favor. By these actions you will be able to understand everything from within your heart. 
O Brahma, when you are absorbed in devotional service, in the course of your creative activities, you will see me in you. And throughout the universe, you will see that you yourself, the universe and the living entities are all in me. This is bhakti. This is inspiring devotion to know who is the source, who is the origin. And Krishna directly is saying these words to Lord Brahma. You will see me in all living entities as well as all over the universe. Just as fire is situated in wood, it's invisible. It's there dormant. You can't see the fire in the wood, but you know with knowledge that it's there. You can't directly see Krishna dancing in Rasalila just in a brick. But because of knowledge, you know that he's there. You know it's his energy that is there. This is what the analogy means to see the fire in the wood. Very beautiful analogy, because we know that fire is in wood. So as much as we know fire is in wood, we should know that Krishna is in absolutely everything. Is he in the pillar? Yes, of course. <clears throat> Only in that state of transcendental vision will you be able to be free from all kinds of illusion. So this is the sword, knowledge, to break this illusion that it's called, I'm in Vrindavan now, I'm not functioning as well as I want to be functioning, this is that, this is that, this is that. This is all illusion to give us the impetus to challenge that and to cut it and to see where we are as pure spirit souls in relationship to everything. When you are free from the conception of gross and subtle bodies and when your senses are free from all influences of the modes of material nature, you will realize your pure form in my association. Krishna doesn't just say these words. How cruel would it be like a mother to a child telling, oh, I'm going to give you something, then the mother never actually gives it. So Krishna is saying, you're going to be with me in my association. Become freed from this illusion of this bodily conception all the way across the area of our activities. And at that time, you'll be situated in pure consciousness. That's our natural consciousness. Go back to our natural consciousness. Since you have desire to increase the population innumerably and expand your varieties of service, you shall never be deprived in this matter because my causeless mercy upon you will always increase for all time. This is another dynamic of Krishna himself. His mercy is always increasing. Don't think, oh, I've had Krishna's mercy now and I had a bucket of it a year ago, but actually now it's not coming. It's infinite. It has no end to his mercy. Every moment of every day, we can get Krishna's mercy if I'm awake to it, if I'm alert to it. In America, they say, up to speed. If we're up to speed, you know, in our consciousness, that means if we're chanting carefully, if we're respectful to all the Vaishnavas, if we're following, if we're honoring all the holy places, if we're living our lives as we know that we should, what is it that makes us not want to live as we know we should? What are these fruitive desires? How I can get some juice for me in the body? What, what is it? That's the fruit of desire that made the lotus pierce the abdomen of Garbhadakshai Vishnu. So it's very deep. It's very deep. We have to take a few deep breaths and really confront it. You are the original Rishi, Krishna is saying to Lord Brahma. And because your mind is always fixed on me, even though you will be engaged in generating various progeny, the vicious mode of passion will never encroach upon you. I said the other day, when I was here a couple months ago, what is the meaning of Viraja? Does anyone remember? The Viraja Ocean or the Raja River. What does it mean? Viraja. Viraja means completely devoid of passion. That's what's separating us from the spiritual world. The spiritual world is a state of consciousness. So what is separating us from that spiritual reality is this mode of passion to do activities and have some result come back. We still do the activities, but we know that Krishna is giving the result. 
this is the point that he's saying to Lord Brahma. Of course, you still have to do all the different activities, but why am I doing them? When the consciousness is purified just because I want to bring pleasure to Radha and Krishna and Guru, that is the purpose of my activities, nothing else. And I know that whatever I do, whatever activity, it's always looking for a result. You put one foot, you would think you want to put one foot in front of the other. You want the result of that foot landing on the ground so that you can walk. As basic as that. Anything that we do, this is passion. So if the purpose of everything is just to please Krishna, then it becomes purified. And then we're not hassled or worried ever about the result. We have no expectations. Bhaktivinoda Thakur describes this as the symptom of humility. To have no expectations. You're not doing anything for a pat on the back. You're not doing anything to get, you know, your slice of the cake or whatever. Nothing. Nothing is doing it with any expect. You know, you're not being nice to someone just so that they will be nice to you. This is what we do. I think that's what Facebook's all about. <laughs> I've just been looking at it lately. Anyway, it's, it's all about, you know, patting each other on the back. These are, you know, mutual admiration societies. It's part of life. It's, it's what we, 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 we live in, a world of social behavior. And part of that social behavior is, you know, keeping the flow with everyone around. But see, where is the illusion part? Am I being sincere is what I'm talking about. Where is my sincerity? This is what I'm talking about, to come to a sincere point. Krishna is saying, although I'm not easily knowable by the conditioned soul, you have known me today because you know my personality is not constituted of anything material, and specifically not of the five gross and subtle elements. So we've just been through a whole description of what are the gross and subtle elements that I've short-circuited quite a bit because it was quite complex and complicated. And I don't understand it, so it's hard for me to speak it. But Lord Brahma, he's able to see that absolutely, because he's sitting on the top of this lotus, and his heads have gone in four directions looking for where is his origin, and then four heads have sprung from that. That's why he has four heads looking for that. So what must be the case of the Lord Brahmas that are described with millions of heads? Which directions did they look in? How did they get their millions of heads? I don't know. When you were contemplating whether there was a source to the stem of the lotus of your birth, you even entered into that stem. You could not trace out anything. But at that time, I manifested my form from within. How merciful and loving is Krishna. O Brahma, the prayers that you have chanted praising the glories of my transcendental activities, the penances you have undertaken to understand me, and your firm faith in me, all of these are to be considered my causeless mercy. It's Krishna's mercy that you get inspired to take to devotional service. It's Krishna's mercy that you're inspired to chant Hare Krishna. It's Krishna's mercy that whatever we do, Prabhupada is actually explaining in this purport how even Lord Brahma undergoes various difficulties, just like the conditioned jiva does, in the sense that he, he didn't know where his origin was, etc. He was inquiring. And it's all mercy, mercy, mercy. In a mood of mercy, we're begging, we're propitiating the Lord in, in that mood. This is, we're getting a glimmer of what is humility. Because that is the core essence to appreciate the Bhagavatam, on, on that level only. I am very much pleased by your description of me in terms of my transcendental qualities, which appear mundane to the mundaners. I grant you all benedictions in your desire to glorify all the planets by your activities. Any human being who prays like Brahma and who thus worships me shall very soon be blessed with the fulfillment of all his desires, for I am the Lord of all benedictions. 
It is the opinion of expert transcendentalists that the ultimate goal of performing all traditional good works, penances, sacrifices, charities, mystical activities, trances, etc., is to invoke my satisfaction. This is bhakti. This is devotion. This is what is devotion. This is what this whole Bhagavatam is giving us. It's giving us the path of devotion. Of course, there is advanced devotion and there is uh, neophyte devotion. But devotion is what is being described. This is what it's giving us. So how could we bypass this Bhagavad in our lives? How could we not take shelter of this Bhagavad? I am the super soul of every individual. I am the supreme director of the dearest. People are wrongly attached to the gross and subtle bodies, but they should be attached to me only. By following my instructions, you can now generate the living entities as before. By dint of your complete Vedic wisdom and the body you have directly received from me, the supreme cause of everything. The sage Maitreya said, after instructing Brahma, the creator of the universe, to expand the primeval Lord, to expand the primeval Lord, the personality of Godhead, in his personal form as Narayan, disappeared. So that takes us up to the end of the ninth chapter. So there's 10, 11, and 12. There's three more chapters in this section on Sarga and Visharga. So I'll discuss those tomorrow as well as approach the topic of Lord Varaha. So basically I'm trying to be very clinical in one sense of just go through in an analytical way all the different chapters. So see them simultaneously. But today I think we've gone more into the heart of actually what is the Bhagavatam about. What is, when we listen to Krishna's words directly to Lord Brahma, there can be no contradiction at all and how profound and sweet and powerful those words are when they land on the platform of some developed consciousness. We're described as, um, what is it? Vipuli Chaitana. Vipulita Chaitana. There's five types of consciousness. The Chaitanya Chaitanya consciousness is trees. Then the Sankulita Chaitanya consciousness, which is animals, etc., insects. And then there's Mukulita Chaitanya consciousness, which is the first human species. And then there's the next one, which is, uh, I think it's Vip Vipuna. Remember what it's called? Chandra. You're supposed to know all these things. How am I supposed to give a class without some people prompting me? I think it's called Vipulita Chaitana. And then there's Puna Vipulita Chaitana, which is the top one. So those are like the, the self-realized souls. We're perhaps in the one below that. We're not in the animal one, and we're not perhaps in the top one. But we're somewhere in the middle. So we have all um, opportunity and advantage to utilize this human birth, because we have heard what its function is for, what its higher purpose is. And everything we should do, every activity, should always be in relationship to the welfare of my soul, in relationship to pleasing that supreme soul, Sri Krishna and Radha. So these are the truths of the Bhagavatam. This is, this is what the Bhagavatam is about. This is the heart of it. So. As I said previously, the purpose of doing these classes is to inspire you to read the Bhagavatam. This is my intention of coming here to speak with you, to inspire you to take shelter, of, to consider it your friend, to consider it your best company. Do you consider it all these things that I described? To consider it um, my greatest love, my greatest treasure is this Srimad Bhagavatam. It's never going to diminish. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Gurudev ki jai, Anantakota Vaishnav Rinda ki jai, Gold Pranandi. Does anyone have any questions? I didn't see you there, Vichitri. Just saw you now. Have you been there all the time? Were you there all the time? <laughs> I didn't think you were. You suddenly appeared. <laughs>
Yes, it's, it's, it's very clear. She's asking about the Vastu and Shakti. It is clear to us because we have the commentaries that are empowered by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Madhavacharya, for example, it's described that he spoke about Vastu Parinamvad. And Ramanuja Acharya also, they had that even though it's described. But if you just have the Bhagavatam words, for example, the translation, you can't even understand parakya. Even though Krishna is playing his flute and they're all running to him, those great Vaishnavas in South India couldn't understand parakya bhav until Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested to reconcile that. Even though all the words are there, they still couldn't appreciate that. So even though, the, how are they able to understand the words? It's like the necessity of Shiksha Guru. If our Diksha Guru has only taken us so far and we need the light of Shiksha to understand more deeply. You know, the simple example I've often said of that. This Shriyam, Prabhupada translates as um, treasure. But what is the treasure? We don't know what the treasure is until our Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, he explained the treasure is Manjari Bhav. So like that, even though the words are there, unless we have the um, teaching to bring out the real meaning of it, this is my understanding to your question. I also thought the same thing. I thought, well, you know, it's quite clear to me reading it through. It's quite clear because Prabhupada is giving the translations and he's giving the commentaries and I'm just taking it like, well, this is normal. You know, but actually without those commentaries and without his translations specifically, then you will perhaps be led to a different conclusion altogether. In this particular point, it doesn't minimize the devotion, but it just clarifies Krishna's position. The devotion is still powerfully flowing, even if you don't understand it's all Shakti that is creating, etc. There's still so much devotion, but it's to Krishna. Our devotion, understanding from the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, has become different because we're focusing on Sri Radha. All the Gaudiyas, they focus on Radha, coming from Mahaprabhu. This is our focus. It's a different focus. The Gaudiyas have a different lineage, a different line, a different teaching from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the greatness of Chaitanya. He's taken it to another level. How many people don't embrace Chaitanya Mahaprabhu today and don't know any of these truths? How many times have we been to different people's houses? They've got no idea who's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They, got no, they never even heard of Manjari Bhav. You know, even Gurudev, when he was at Uchagaon in 2006 or something, speaking to all those pandas, and they all thought Radha and Krishna were married. And he explained so beautifully, he was declared the Yuga Acharya at that time, at that meeting, you know, because he, ex he just put them straight, more or less, you know. It's like, we, we don't, you know. So in that same sense, that Vastu Parinamvad was running through, even though the words are there. But Shakti Parinamvad is the key that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us. That's what I think is the answer to that. Because I also thought that same thing. Anybody other question? Good question. You have? Tunki says you have a question. I have many. Huh? I have a question, but the other about the past times I was playing yesterday. Go on then, what? Yeah, Satchivati. Um, yeah. Did they eat fish? Because if it's a fisherman, then the daughter. Probably. Mm -hmm. Probably. She's, she said that. We can't, don't try to understand this the way we understand it today. It was not a sin for the Chatriyas to eat meat. They had to go and protect the hermitages of the sages, and they would exhibit their prowess by going out and tackling a tiger with a knife. You know, that's what the Chatriyas would do, the Chatriya spirit. You know, it wasn't like, you know, they walked into a supermarket and just pulled it out frozen from a thing. It was a whole, you know, like interaction between them and the creature. And they would take karma for that. 
Of course they would. Chatris are not the same as um, brahmanas. The brahmanas would never take that. But the apsara, all kinds of things happen in the, but they can reconcile it with the purity. It's like it says that fire, you know, you can throw a dead body into fire or you can use it, but it then becomes impure. You know, this is how it's described when Parikshit Maharaj is asking Shukadeva Goswami, the end of the Rasa Panchadiya, how, how could Krishna dance with other men's wives? How are you going to answer that? Krishna is beyond morality. So you get a person who's all laced up with morality, like the South Indian Brahmanas, they, they can't understand. It's like that's why Jiva Goswami was explaining Swakya Bhav, you know, that they were actually married. He couldn't open that Parakya Bhav to some of his disciples because they had this obstruction of morality. So also to understand these pastimes. Sachivati, I, I, I don't have a Mahabharata here. If I find one, I can look at the actual history. But she came from the heavenly world. She was an Apsara. And she was a great queen. Shantanu also came from the heavenly world. From Swagaloka I'm talking about, not from the spiritual world. And um, whatever activities they performed at that time probably wasn't excessive. It's like even some of the devotees in uh, Puri. Right? They would offer Lord Jagannath fish. How are you going to reconcile that? It's not something to trip over and get all hung up about. Somebody did last year, actually, in Germany. Madam Maharaj was speaking in Stuttgart, and someone was saying, no, no, but the Chatteris used to eat some meat, and he was saying, no, they didn't, and gave me so many shasta broad in appreciating the different cultural times and the different necessities. I don't understand entirely, but that's my, the limit of my understanding on that subject. So she probably ate fish. <laughs> Yes, 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 who's begging, yes, 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 good example, good story, yes, 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 you know the story, that, 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 that mendicant came begging and to the butcher's shop and then he saw this shellogram, the, the butcher was using as a weight for the meat. Oh my God, you know, I'll take that. Don't give me any pennies, you know. And that night he had an amazing dream and the shellogram revealed himself, his identity to him and said, you please take me straight back to that butcher. I've been with that butcher in many lives. It's only in this life that he's forgotten about me because in his previous life, that um, butcher was a, a great sage and he was meditating, just like Mandavya Rishi actually. And uh, a cow came running past him and ran around behind him. And this sage was doing monobrot. And a few minutes later, a butcher came with a knife and said, have you seen that cow? And this sage only had his arms. So he sort of indicated with his arms that it went behind. So the butcher went around behind him, found the cow and killed it. So for being a, an accomplice in the killing of that cow, he had to take the birth of a Muslim in his next birth. And then when the mendicant the next morning took the shellogram back to the butcher and explained the dream to him, then something tweaked in the Muslim's heart of memory, of worship of that shellogram. He locked up his butcher shop and thought, now I'm going to go to um, Jagannath Puri and see God that I've heard about. So he goes off to Puri, and in those days, they didn't have any hotels or dharmshalas so much. They'd stay in the houses of brahmanas. So when he was just almost in Puri, he stopped at this one Brahmin's house and asked if he could stay the night. And the Brahmin said, yes, okay. And then his wife, the Brahmin's wife, took him to show him his room. And the Brahmin's wife propositioned him when they came into the room. And this uh, uh, butcher, this Muslim, because he had a sanskar of celibacy from his previous birth as a rishi, he completely rejected these advances of this Brahmin's wife. And then in the middle of the night, this Brahmin wife again came and she brought a huge knife with her. She said, if you don't allow me to come into your bed with you, I'm going to go and kill my husband and I'm going to scream to all the neighbors that you've murdered my husband because you want to have sex with me. 
<laughs> Which is the, what the heck's going on here, you know? Because, of course, she would have been believed because they all knew her from birth. They didn't know this traveling Muslim mendicant, you know, at all. They didn't know him. So, again, this sanskar of celibacy arose and he said, get out of here. This is horrendous, you know, this is just crazy. Out, out, out. So she went and she killed her husband. And she screamed out to all the neighbors. All the neighbors came, what's happened, what's happened? Look, this mendicant, he's killed my husband. You know, he, didn't want, he wanted to have sex with me. You know, look what he's done. Immediately they arrested him, took him to the court, and the punishment in that village for this act at that time was to chop his arms off. So that's what they did. The next day, chopped his arms off. So the mendicant gets so bewildered, he's sitting thinking, what the heck did I do? But he's still got this shalagram shila on him. So he like crawls to Puri, and it just happened to be the Rathiatra day on Puri. And Lord Jagannath was riding on his cart. And as soon as he saw Lord Jagannath, he straight away, hurry ball! And he saw that his arms had come back. And he was just in some kind of like, such a shocked state of consciousness. From first of all having his arms chopped off, and then having them come back in front of Lord Jagannath. He was just completely like out there. And then he's asking, he's talking to Jagannath directly. He says, oh, this, this is a miracle. You know, why is this? Why did I have my arms chopped off in the first place? He was feeling so innocent. And then Lord Jagannath reveals in his heart, actually in a previous birth you were a sage. And you indicated with your arms where that beautiful cow went so that butcher could take his life. That's why you had to suffer this punishment in this birth. And then still in his state of shock, he said, well, who was that woman who killed the husband, the Brahmin husband just now? He said, that woman was the cow in her previous birth. And the husband was the butcher. <laughs> So this is like karma, how it goes on, how it all spins. This is a, from the Puranas, this story. So this can happen, but the point that Tungavidya is making, at that, that Krishna never leaves, you know, however, wasn't that the point? However, yes, things are not always direct like that. They often seem to be like off on a tangent, like your arms get cut off, etc. Anyway, that's just a pastime. Shilgurudev ki jai, nantakota.